So it really does help when you put the batteries in correctly. And that was my fault. Um, so at this point, I need to make a confession. Each time I begin preparation to share a message with you, I'm struck with the overwhelming sense of responsibility, as well as the amount of work and study that it takes for me to prepare a message. I know that there is a seriousness associated with being a teacher. In fact, James says to avoid it altogether if possible. It's at this point where I begin to think to myself, why did I volunteer for this? However, as I prepare and dive deep into the Word of God so that I can be faithful to the text, I find that the Word of God is open to me in new and fresh ways. There are lessons learned and convictions deepened that I've only been able to understand through intensive study of the Word. The reason I continue to volunteer to step into the pulpit when given the opportunity is that there is great benefit in the discipline and prayerful study of God's word. And I pray that as a byproduct, you will all be encouraged as well. So we're currently on our way through the book of Mark in our series, The Cross and the Crown. In last week's uh, scripture passage, Mark, Pastor Mark took us through the account of the mountaintop configuration of Jesus, transfiguration of Jesus. Today, we will be looking into the next section of scripture in the gospel of Mark chapter 9 verses 14 through 29, and with the help of parallel passages in the books of Matthew and Luke. There's a great contrast between last week's account and that of our text today. The transfiguration of Jesus took place on a mountaintop, while today's passage takes place in the valley. On the mountaintop, there is a father with a beloved son, but in the valley, there's a father with a tortured son. On the mountaintop, there is amazement from the witnesses, but in the valley, there is arguing and conflict. The mountaintop is, was overshadowed with the presence of God, but in the valley, there was demonic possession. So before we read our passage, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to share your word today. And I ask, Lord, that you would be with me, that you would give me wisdom, Lord, that you would help my... My, my thinking and my speech, Lord, that I would be able to bring the message in a way that is pleasing to you. And Lord, I, I pray for the people that will be listening to this as well, that you would open their ears and that you would show them what you would have for them. I ask this in Jesus' name. So we're going to be reading from Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29, and you can uh, follow along in your pew Bible or up on the screen. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell to the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father, how long has, it, has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus th saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And we had, when he had entered the house, the disciples asked him privately, 
why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So verse 14 says, when they came back to the disciples, they thought a large crowd around them. Now Jesus, along with Peter, James, and John, are coming back to rejoin the other nine apostles and probably some other disciples as they were there as well. Luke tells us in his account that they had come down from the mountain the day after Jesus was transfigured. Mark also says that there was a large crowd surrounding the disciples that included some scribes. They were arguing with them. Now, the pastor mentioned last week when speaking on the transfiguration, the beginning of this passage sounds very similar to the account of Moses on Mount Sinai. In the book of Exodus, starting in chapter 24, Moses goes up to the mountaintop and waits to receive the stone tablets that God was preparing for him. After spending time with God on the mountain, chapter 32 tells of the rebellion in the camp of the Israelites. Joshua describes it as a sound of war in the camp, and Moses finds them in a state of disorder. When Jesus came down the mountain, he found the disciples and the scribes in a state of arguing confusion. The Encyclopedia Britannica describes the scribes this way. In the first century, scribes and Pharisees were two largely distinct groups. Although presumably some scribes were Pharisees, scribes had knowledge of the law and could draft legal documents such as contracts for marriage, divorce, loans, inheritance, mortgages, and the sale of land. Every village had at least one scribe. They insult, <clears throat> like the Pharisees, the scribes were experts in the law. As we will see in a few moments, this is a gotcha moment for the scribes. They insulted the disciples, and by extension, Jesus, because of the, dis the disciples' inability to cast out the demon of, of the boy. This all took place under the watchful eye of the gathered crowd. So here's point number one. So I didn't include any slides today, so you can write these down. There, you have notes to write them down, or you can listen to the message again after. So point number one is, as true believers, we'll, there will always be opposition to our message and to our beliefs. Again, as true believers, there will always be opposition to our message and to our beliefs. Jesus was opposed for his message throughout the New Testament, even to the point of his own crucifixion and death. He warned the disciples that if they followed him, that they would faith, faith the same opposition and persecution. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus speaks of this persecution to his followers, followers and it ends with this. You will all be hated, all because of my name. Also in John chapter 15, Jesus says, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. In the New Testament, Acts chapter 3 and 4 tells the story of Peter and John getting arrested after preaching a sermon in the temple. The seventh chapter of Acts gives the account of Stephen speaking in his own defense and subsequent stoning. In Acts chapter 12, Peter was in prison, and in the 16th chapter of Acts, Paul and Silas are in prison. Ultimately, Peter and Paul lost their lives due to the opposition to their message and their relationship with Jesus Christ. History tells us that many of the disciples went on to their deaths because of their relationship with Jesus. In fact, throughout history, many people have died at the hands of those who opposed their message. Early church father Polycarp, who personally, personally knew the apostle John, uh, he died because they asked him to deny his faith. John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley are just a few of the medieval martyrs that died upholding their faith. Today in the West, Christians have not yet suffered to the point of death. However, Canadian pastors James Coates and Tim Stevens were arrested and jailed for breaking of COVID restrictions that contradicted the church's mandate to meet. In America, we are faced with confronting the lies of the new social architects. 
where truth is not grounded in what we read in the Bible, rather is flexible depending on how an individual feels. At the Truth Matters conference that Holly and I attended, Pastor Mike Riccardi spoke on these issues, saying, if you refuse to affirm and celebrate homosexuality, if you refuse to concede that the baby in the womb is just a clump of cells that can be discarded at the mother's will, if you refuse to call Richard Rachel, or refuse to use someone's uh, personal profession pronouns, if you refuse to repent of your whiteness, you may be canceled. The social architects of today are not satisfied if we just keep our beliefs to ourselves. They want nothing less than our affirmation, our celebration, and the renunciation of our biblical worldview. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand that conflict with the world is inevitable if we are to live out our faith as commanded in the word of God. This is summed up in John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, when Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world will love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Now, getting back to our text, in typical fashion, Mark, in verse 15, state, starts with, Immediately, when the crowd saw him, they were amazed and they began running to greet him. The Greek word used for amaze can be described as to amaze or to terrify. The same word is used later on in Mark to describe Jesus as being distressed when going into the Garden of Gethsemane. It's interesting that Mark uses the word to describe the crowd's reaction when we see Jesus approaching. In his commentary, Matthew Henry gives a possible explanation. Related back to the account of Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus that we looked at earlier. When Moses was up on the mountain, his countenance would change because of his close proxi physical proximity to God. In Exodus 34, we see that when Moses came down the mountain with the second set of tablets, it says that his face was radiant and that Aaron and the sons of Israel were afraid to come near him. Matthew Henry says, so perhaps did Christ's face, in some measure at least, instead of seeming fatigued, there appeared a wonderful vibrancy and liveliness in his looks, which amazed them. While this is a possible explanation, it seems to contradict Jesus' uh, strict instructions to Peter, James, and John to tell no one what they had seen on the mountaintop. The crowds were always amazed and drawn to Jesus because he was a miracle worker, and that he could perform signs and wonders as well as his authoritative teaching. Jesus' return was no doubt welcomed by the disciples. Jesus would be able to get them out of this messy situation. They thought Jesus' arrival would be bad news for the scribes. In verse 16, Jesus asked what they're discussing or what they're arguing about. Before the disciples or the scribes can answer Jesus' question, a man from the crowd steps up, and in Luke's account, it says that the man shouted, and he said, I beg you to look at my son. The father, wa the father wanted to make himself heard over the crowd. Verses 17 and 18 describe the desperate condition of the son. In Matthew's account, the father calls him a lunatic and very ill. While both Mark and Luke, the father describes his son as being possessed with an evil spirit. The unclean spirit causes devastating effects on the boy. First, the father says that the boy is mute. He can't speak. Then the unclean spirit slams him to the ground. In Luke, it says that it throws him into convulsions and mauls him. In Greek, the verb form of maul has a meaning to shatter or to break into pieces. Finally, in Matthew's description, it says that the boy often falls into fire and often into water. It was a full-time job for this father and his family to look after his son and keep him from hurting himself and tending to his needs. Now here in Mark, it says that the man specifically brought the son to Jesus for healing. So imagine his disappointment after, finding, after arriving to find out that Jesus was not in the crowd. However, after being with Jesus over the last few years and sitting under his teachings, the disciples probably believed that they had the ability to heal the man's son. 
especially after Jesus had sent them out with power and authority over all demons and to heal diseases. As described in Luke 9, their confidence came because of their successes described in Mark 6. They were casting out many demons and were anointing many sick people and healing them. After the father described the condition of his son to Jesus and noting that Jesus was not with his disciples, the father says, I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not. So imagine the scene. The disciples are together. They're waiting for Jesus, Peter, James, and John, to return from the mountaintop. As time passes, a crowd gathers with the anticipation of seeing Jesus. With that crowd, a group of scribes gather as well. But they are there to question and to cause trouble. One man stands out among the crowd. He's there so Jesus can heal his son. Jesus isn't there, but he's desperate. Probably a little skeptical. But he brings his son to the disciples and he tells them to heal him. The disciples, they've been through this before. They've seen Jesus heal and they've seen him cast out demons. In fact, they were both pretty, they were pretty successful in the past at doing that type of thing. Then there are the scribes. They want another opportunity to stand against the, the deceiver from Galilee. They want to see if Jesus' disciples have the same abilities as he does. The moment comes, they try, but the disciples of Jesus can't heal the boy. So here's point number two. Living out the Christian life in your own strength is not pleasing to God and will eventually fail. Again, living out the Christian life in your own strength is not pleasing to God and will eventually fail. So as we saw earlier, Jesus had given the disciples authority to heal and to cast out demons. They were doing so during an earlier commissioning. It's clear that the disciples had been given the ability to cast out demons and heal. What made this encounter different? It seems reasonable that disciples needed a lesson on their need for reliance on God. Their earlier successes in dealing with demons may have given them a false sense of their ability and that it came within themselves. Or they may have lost focus on the source of their power. We can imagine that with their earlier successes, they believed that this was just another run-of-the-mill encounter with a demon that could easily be dispatched. They could show their ability to the gathered crowd to the scribes and to Jesus when he returned from the mountain. One commentary that I read said that the disciples did not lack power, experience, or authority. They lacked the faith to deal with this powerful demon. The deficiency did not consist in the lack of confidence. In fact, they were surprised that they could not cast out this demon. The problem lay in the failure to make God, rather than their own gifts, the object of their confidence. Having discerned the strength of the demon possessing the boy, the apostles should have sought God's help in believing prayer. If they had done so, even a mustard seed's amount of faith could have handled this situation. We all need to rely on God rather than our own strength. John chapter 15, verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, he is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Philippians 4, verses 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus himself was a perfect example to his disciples and to us of the need for connecting with the Father rather than doing things on our own strength. He took, he took the time to get away to reconnect with the Father, especially during key times in his life. After the feeding of the 5,000 and before the healing of the multitudes at Gennesaret, Matthew 14 says that he went up on a mountain by himself and prayed. Again, after the healing of the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath and before calling of his 12 disciples, Luke 6 says it was at this time that he went off to a mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And then before going to the cross, in Mark 14, Jesus tells his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. There are also other biblical examples to show how a disconnect from God can lead to devastating consequences. In the book of Revelation, 
Jesus either affirms or warns each of seven churches. Of those seven churches, three of them get severe warnings because they have lost their connection to Jesus to the point where they don't even recognize how far they've fallen. Jesus threatens to remove the church of Ephesus' lampstand because they had left their first love. Jesus tells the church of Sardis that even though they think they're alive, they are actually dead. Finally, Jesus warns the church of Laodicea that they were in danger of being spit out of his mouth because they had lost touch with him. They had put themselves on autopilot. In verse 17, it says, Because you say I am rich, and I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing, you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. These churches took their eyes off Jesus and began to believe in their own power and strength, which is not pleasing to God and leads to spiritual impotence. So after hearing, the, after hearing from the father of the demon-possessed boy and how the disciples were unable to heal him, the end of verse 19 says, O unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Jesus' rebuke is, is directed toward his disciples, who by this point in his ministry should have had the faith to, ca- faith to cast out the demon. He asked a series of rhetorical questions for which he did not expect answers. But we can hear the weariness and exasperation in those questions. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Jesus knows that his time on earth with his disciples is growing short, yet there is still much that they need to learn. The verse ends with, bring him to me. Jesus is going to show compassion to the Father and to the Son by ending the boy's suffering, as well as use it as a teachable moment for his disciples. Now, as the boy is being brought to Jesus, the demon affects the boy just as the father had described. Just being there in the presence of Jesus causes the demon to throw a temper tantrum, maybe a final attempt to permanently injure the boy before being cast out, possibly because he knows that his time is short or maybe an attempt to weaken what was left of the father's faith. Jesus, with calm and compassion, asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? Commentators assume that Jesus, knowing all things, did not need to ask the boy's father the length of the illness. He already knew the answer. However, it did show the father and those with him that Jesus was empathetic and took a personal interest in him and his son. In verse 22, the father ends by saying, If you can do anything, take pity on us. Contrast this with the statement that the leper makes to Jesus in Matthew 6, verses 2. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Both of these if statements call into question something of Jesus' character or desire. The leper's statement questions the will of Jesus. And the response is, I am willing, be cleansed. However, the father's statement calls into question Jesus' power to heal. And Jesus takes notice, if, if, if you can. The father obviously has some measure of faith. He specifically sought to bring the son to Jesus for healing. He was even willing to have the disciples try and heal his son when Jesus was not in the crowd. Ultimately, with each setback and failure, the father's faith dwindled until he questioned the very power of Jesus himself. Jesus helps to restore the father's faith by telling him, all things are possible to him who believes. In verse 24, it says that immediately the father cried out, which in Greek is kratzo, and has the meaning of to cry, to call out in a loud voice, or urgent prayer. The father sees this opportunity to finally get the healing for his son by blurting out his own belief, although imperfect in the power of Jesus to heal his son. In this account, Jesus used the faith of the boy's father to play a part in the miracle to heal his son. We see the same interaction between faith and healing when when in Matthew chapter 13, it says that in Nazareth, he did not do many miracles due to their lack of faith. faith. Jesus took this opportunity to make this a teachable moment for his disciples on the relationship between their faith and his power. 
This prolonged interaction with the demon-possessed boy and the father most certainly caught the attention of the gathered crowd. Verse 25 says that the crowd was uh, rapidly gathering. Jesus, not willing to make a spectacle of this boy in a situation, we have to assume that he was not going to perform this miracle for the sake of the crowd. He had already established his credentials as Messiah, and there was no need to make a show of this situation to please the onlookers. So without further wait, Jesus rebukes the demon, I command you to come out of him and do not enter him again. In this we see that not only does Jesus command the unclean spirit to leave the boy in the present, but com commands him to never return in the future. The demon makes a final violent exit, leaving the boy looking so much like a corpse that those around him think that he's actually dead. But Jesus, verse 20 says, took him by the hand and raised him. Imagine the joy of the father after years of caring for his son and watching him suffer. Jesus raises the boy up and returns him completely healed. Now point number three is faith, no matter how small, pleases God. Again, it's faith, no matter how small, pleases God. So this passage, is, this passage ends as the disciples are able to get Jesus alone, away from the crowd. In this moment of privacy, they ask Jesus, why could we not drive it out? His response in verse 29 is, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Matthew gives us more detail. He records Jesus' full answer to their question as, because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have the faith, the side of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So here Jesus makes the connection between faith and prayer. In fact, faith and prayer can be seen as different sides of the same coin. The book of Hebrews has much to say on the subject of, of faith, and in chapter 11, verse 1, gives a great definition. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The Amplified Bible says, now faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for, or divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality, faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. We live by natural faith every day. Like when we board an airplane, we get into a car, we drink water, or we go to the doctor for treatment. Natural faith is rooted in the physical world, like the laws of physics, human achievements, or personal experience. Now, this is not the kind of faith as described in Hebrews 11.1, 1, or the faith that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 17. Biblical or spiritual faith is God-focused. The assurance and conviction is rooted in the character of God himself. It's not natural for us, but instead is a gift of God that he gives us. And that's in Ephesians 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 8. The gift, like our salvation, is ours for the asking through prayer. The forerunner commentary states it this way. A lack of faith is a sign of a weak prayer life. Prayer provides the repeated and continual contact with God that we need to get to know him. This sets in motion the process that will lead to faith, to God being willing to give us the gift of faith. The prayerful person becomes the faithful person, not the other way around. Hebrews 11.6 illustrates this point, but without faith it's impossible to please him, for he, who, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So think of Jesus' frustration with his disciples. He said that mustard-sized faith could move mountains. Yet, they, yet he rebuked them for the littleness of their faith. That must have meant that the, the disciples' faith was smaller than that of a mustard seed. The disciples' failure to cast out the demon was rooted in their the reliance on natural faith. The focus of their faith was the experience of their past successes. However, they lacked the spiritual faith in the character and promise of God. 
their only hope for success would have been to seek God and to pray for the necessary faith to face the challenge of casting out this demon. In his essay on the prayer of faith, Sinclair Ferguson says, this then is the prayer of faith, to ask God to accomplish what he has promised in his word. That promise is the only grounds for our confidence in asking. Such confidence is not worked up from within our emotional life. Rather, it is given and supported by what God has said in Scripture. True prayer can never be divorced from real holiness. Prayer of faith can be made only by the righteous man whose life is being more and more aligned with the covenant graces and grace and purposes of God. In the realm of prayer, too, faith without works is dead. So here's some takeaways. And our first point was that true believers, there's always opposition to our message and beliefs. So number one is if you are faithful to the biblical truths, the world will oppose you. If you are faithful to biblical truths, the world will oppose you. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. That's Matthew 5.44. Number two, Study the words so that you can stand firm on what you believe. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. That's Matthew 24, verse 13. Number three, lovingly share your faith with others. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head, even Christ. That's Ephesians 4, chapter, 15. chapter 4, verse 15. Our second point was that living out the Christian life in our own strength is not pleasing to God and will eventually fail. Point number one, self-confidence in our Christian walk can have disastrous results. Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take take heed that he does not fall. That's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Number two, walk by faith. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, Romans 8.8. And number three, rely on God's word to direct your life. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. That's Psalm 149, verse 4. Our third point was faith, no matter how small, pleases God. So the first one is live a life of faith. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I have set my heart on your laws. Psalm 119, 30. Number two, faith saves. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And third, faith comes through intimate knowledge of God. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, Romans ten seventeen. Finally, is there sin that separates you from God today? Does Jesus have a preeminent place in your life? Today, you have the opportunity to, to start a brand new relationship with God. However, your rebellion and your sins are what keeps you separated from him. The good news is that the Father has provided the perfect sacrifice in his son, Jesus, who was fully God, yet fully man. He opened the way to the Father by taking our punishment upon himself so that we could be made acceptable before God. All you need to do is repent, which is to turn from your rebellion and trust or have faith in the sacrifice that Jesus provided for you. That faith need only be small, the size of a mustard seed to believe. And if you ask God, he will even give you the necessary faith. The Bible, God's own words, tells us plainly, it is by by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Ask God for the faith to believe today. If If you make that your prayer, I encourage you to see one of the deacons or call the church in the coming week. And we would love to talk to you and help you take your next step in your walk with Christ. Let's pray. 
Father, I just thank you, Lord, again, for this opportunity to share your message today, Father. I, I just ask that you would, uh, that you would take the, the hearing of this message, Lord, and that you would um, drive it deep into the heart of, of not only myself, Lord, but the people listening. And Father, I, we think of, the, we think of the, uh, this being Memorial Day weekend. We think of the, the men and women who have lost their lives for our freedom. But Father, your, your son, Jesus, he paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom, I, uh, the freedom for us to live with you forever. And we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to worship you and bring you glory. Now, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. Amen.